Okay, so I'm joined here today with Leon Sao from Type Talks for type conversation. Type, type Talks type. is Joyce. <laughs> we have Damn similar it. names. Damn it. <laughs> we should keep that in though. We should keep that in. Uh, okay, okay. So we're from Type Tips, uh, and I'll share a link uh, to the channel down below. I'm not going to give you a big introduction, uh, but people are welcome to check out your content and your work. What I can say is we're going to be discussing the existential opportunities and consequences of AI and um, yeah, what possibilities could come from uh, this new technology, but also what challenges that we might see uh, with the rise of uh, tools like ChatGDP, Midjourney, Dolly, and all kinds of things. And so I want to start off by just asking you, how has uh, machine learning and uh, AI and these kind of tools affected you? And how have they challenged your thoughts? And uh, how do you look at this new development? That's a really good question. So like when I first heard about it, at least when I heard about Midjourney. Actually, my first, to be honest, my first initial uh, response to that was this sense of shock, right? But afterwards, you know, when I was able to process it more, I, I was able to come to my own conclusions about how we could use AI. And since I work as a psychotherapist, what I'm very interested in is the psychological consequences, like what is the good and what is the bad that comes along with it. Obviously, I'm also in the creative arena, so I know I've been uh, in touch with artists. And, you know, artists, they have different opinions about the matter. But I know there's a lot of artists who are also suffering, too, that, you know, they recently, their businesses have been really greatly impacted. Um, there's a lot of, like, con work that's being done as well that that makes artists struggle too, because people are like just copying the work and that happens too as well with chat GPT. So these are things that I would like to address. Like how can we go about addressing these concerns? Right. So you have concerns about the primarily how uh, chat KDP and uh, mid journey and these tools gather their information and learn how they are developed and how they are taught to do what they yes. do today. Yes, and, and I also believe that there's a way to go about AI that takes away all these cons, like the negative consequences. And I um, I think a one thing that I see is that people assume that whatever AI develops is the future, that everything that it develops is inevitable. But that's not necessarily the case. The growth of technology is inevitable for sure, right? But Technology will depend on our psychological state. If we collectively have a healthy psychological state, we'll be developing things that reflect that. We'll be developing things like technology that will be very meaningful for us. And but if we're not, we're like the, we have an unhealthy psychological state collectively. We're gonna create things that would just cause us to zone out, like the the negative aspects of social media. I do believe there's positive aspect, but we'll have technology that will emphasize the negative aspects if we. And, and so on and so on and so forth with that. Yeah, yeah. The thing, all of this has made me really think. And uh, one question I found myself having was, what would Carl Jung say about uh, these kind of tools? And uh, yes, what first came to my mind was he'd be, of course, fascinated with what this says about our current state as a human society, because what the, these things do is they are mirrors of what uh, human activity online and what we have said and written and uh, what we have drawn and made online. You know, it, it's a mirror, but it's a bad one, right? Because it's a very poor imitation of the process because. Right, for sure. How I look at it today is uh, this is not really a human tool yet, right? So a lot of people look at this as like true AI to almost to some extent. But what it only does, what, the only thing it's able to do today is pattern recognition, right? So the only thing it can do is it can look at what other people are doing and what have other people have done. And it can try to mimic through rote memorization of, you know, the data itself, what might fit or what might look good. Um, okay. So... Yes. What I'm wondering is, uh, uh, what cognitive functions do you see in chat GDP uh, and in these tools today? Like, what what, uh, what do you yeah. see is happening with these tools at the moment? What do you feel it's missing to really be able to compete with us as people? Right. I, well, I think you make really good points. And I've 
you know, read your points before, like we messaged back and forth. I thought like they're very thought out, like what you're concerned about. Like you, you see the positive of AI at the same time, you also see the the aspect where um, there might be less creativity that happens or people may, may not be able to understand the value of personal expression and, and true artistry, right? A lot of mm -hmm. what these programs do is that they copy. And that's a really bad thing because, you know, I've been talking with artists individually about this and they're really sad in that even if they don't, they barely put their work online, even if there's just a few pieces, uh, this program, these art programs could copy the style, could recognize the style and copy it to the extent that even the artist can't tell whether they made it or the machine made it. So that 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 is something to be concerned about. Like, and that has consequences on everybody too, because um, there's a concern about like not being able to have new styles. Like, the artists need to be able to devote time to be able to create these new styles. But then if their style could just be immediately copied and put into the system, which you know the, the, this whole AI could universally learn things. So. Um, any kind of style just kind of picks up and absorbs in, right? So there's a problem of, you know, there may not be anything that's new or creative. However, I want to talk about like how Carl Jung would take a look at this, right? So Carl Jung believes that, you know, um, how humanity progresses kind of goes along cycles. So there's ups and downs. And, um, and perhaps in this period, what I see is that in this case, there might be an overemphasis on thinking in a way. Like, mm -hmm. I think in some ways, um, there in society, there's overemphasis on feeling, even currently. I, I could get that's a different topic. But in this case, the whole idea that everything could be kind of reduced down to algorithms or to ones and zeros, that's a very kind of narrow view. It's not going to uh, be beneficial for people. It's, and I think you put it pretty well because we've been talking about this together and you've mentioned about how you know it's not even really true thinking or really true feeling right uh, yeah. it's not like really true like the the machine's not really able to reason in itself like in a very sophisticated way so it doesn't really represent thinking but it's just like a just a really bad form of thinking that is yeah. trying to like take over the feeling world and the, the value of self-expression yeah I mean, there's been a long uh, movement online happening towards more and more standardized forms of content. And you'll notice today, if you search for how to cook uh, Thai curry, you know, you'll get the, the most corporate looking, you know, page using the all the technical SEO rules and all the, you know, uh, standards that machines uh, in Google uh, use to determine whether this is a good post or a bad post. And of course, you know, the human factor is weighed in here, but not to a very high extent. The technical SEO is still uh, one of the primary factors for the ranking mm -hmm. of these kinds of content. Right. And a robot uh, like uh, ChatGDP will obviously be a lot better at producing these forms of content, which dep depend on robot-decided rules. <laughs> you know, uh, if the robots right. decide the rules, the robots will also beat the rules more easily than the humans, right? So one right. thing that I see uh, that needs to happen is we need to perhaps challenge to which extent, you know, we rely on technical SEO today and how that is damaging, you know, our, our collective unconscious or conscious online, you know, or how that yes. uh, like impacts us and uh, what we create. Because what we're ending up with and what I'm seeing with, you know, Mid Journey and with Chat GDP and with these tools is extremely standardized imagery. You know, if you type sure, a woman, yeah. you get a white woman. And if you type like uh, uh, a car, you get the, the most car car in the world, you know, for a purely <laughs> standard view, right? But yes, uh, the personality yes. here tends to really fade away. So the, you know, the unique individual factor, you know, like of a person and their own experiences of what, car, what a car is and what kind of cars exist in the world, that doesn't really get taken into the equation. Yes, absolutely. I think, yeah, um, that you make a really good point there. And that's something I've observed is, you know, all this, the negative aspects of AI are all enabled by uh, trends that already have been happening already. There's this a tendency towards, uh, um, you know, reduction of authenticity. For instance, there's there's been, you know, a lot of advertising. What advertising do is try to show you, try to find some way to connect with you. And what everyone wants is, 
to have a sense of meaning, to have a sense of human connection. And advertisements tend to exploit that, right? So this is just a further exploitation of already existing trends. And you make a really good point. It's all about like changing the collective consciousness. Because once we do that, like our collective psychology, then we'll be producing psych, you know, technology and AI that would actually be beneficial, that actually helps enhance us to be able to connect with doing things that are truly meaningful and ha having us be able to connect with each other in meaningful ways instead of these really artificial ways. But I think um, there could be a, there's always a good side to a shadow thing that's happening. So this sh shadow thing is like, now we're, all this is like in front of our face right now. It's like very much intensified. All these negative trends are now in front of our face right now. And we are human, we are beings that learn through contrast, right? For mm -hmm. example, after World War II, we, <laughs> you know, take some, a bad, really bad, terrible event like that for us to really see the value of the human life and human dignity. And afterwards, after World War II, there are regulations about scientific experiments. So before you could just do whatever scientific experiments on human beings, and that's all right. We So the idea is like, you know, we have the technology to do any sort of scientific experiments on human beings, but we don't do it. We follow certain kind of principles. And why is that? It's because there's regulations in place that reflect our values, because we have a collective consciousness that values human life and quality of life. And I believe the same thing could happen with AI if we take action that right now we're treated like guinea pigs, basically, and they're just going to like do whatever to us and, they, and justify it by saying, you know, this is just, you know, the advancement of technology is inevitable. Right. But really, that's not the case. I think with regulation, I think we could have very good uh, technology, just like with regulation of sciences, we have, you know, quality um, medical care, right? Because we could trust in the system. If we believe, if we could see ourselves, um, if we go into an experiment and we know that we're not going to be uh, deceived or they're not going to try to do something that's harmful to us, then more people are going to trust the system and they're, they're going to do this, you know, be involved in experiments that could help enhance science. So science is being treated this way where um, it has this regulation, which actually benefits science in itself. We need to do the same thing with technology too, because technology is now, you know, they're kind of like, do just do just about whatever. It doesn't matter how it affects our psychological state. Yeah. But with regulation, I think we could actually get positive, something that's positive. So, what Carl Jung would say here is that we're learning through contrast, meaning we need this to be kind of put in front of our face about how bad things are so that we start to value authenticity. Because even before all this happened, people were only looking at art for just like seven seconds. They're not really engaging with it, right? But here, yeah. now all this is put in front of us. We'll really start to teach. We could really use this as an opportunity to teach people to really see what is valuable in art and what's really valuable in self-expression. And be able to turn things around. Yeah, I have my own uh, political opinions when it comes to the discussion of regulation. And personally, mm -hmm. I'd say I believe we should be regulating society and the structures around society and not so much this technology, because this technology is still in its infancy and we need to see what it's capable of before we can decide and think, okay, what is it we need to do with well, this technology? I, I hope I hope it's not too late, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what we need it to could, consider... It could do significant damage before, like, um, so, yeah, but, but it, um, what, yeah, go ahead. It most likely will, just like Industrial Revolution, cause a lot of damage to the previous structures yes. that were around them. But I hope that it will drive a positive evolution in society. Uh, however... Uh, we can get into like the political discussion around this in a bit later. I wanted to uh, discuss something m more specific uh, because you mentioned how artists uh, often saw their work, you know, taken away or like copied uh, and reused right. in a sense uh, through these technologies. Uh, what I've noticed is uh, I'm also noticing an uptick in blog posts and YouTube videos about the MBTI and the 16 personalities developed by uh, AI using mm -hmm. art from AI and uh, robot voice and uh, robot art inside the whole thing, right? So this is not just happening there, but it's also happening on blogs all over the internet and uh, on YouTube. So what we're seeing is kind of an explosion right now of new kinds of content. Mm. And what I'm worried about is uh, that we're currently 
not we haven't developed the critical thinking faculties to sift through these kinds of content and to tell you know when is this a, when is this a good video that I should tune into and watch that I will actually enjoy and get value from watching, and when is this a nice looking thumbnail that looks like it's a good video because it has a nice and engaging thumbnail title, but when I actually watch it and after watching it I feel nothing I learned nothing and I you know gain nothing because a lot okay. of the time the educational value of these kinds of content. They're nothing new. They're nothing original. They're nothing, you know, true. interesting, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think um, you're you're right about that. So that that is certainly a concern right now. Um, I think there is value to be able to be able to really do your own work and find that self expression. And maybe at first it's it's hard, but later on, like when you really could cultivate your own voice, like like you have for your own channel, right? And I have for my own channel, it's very meaningful. And uh, it's much better than getting a dopamine hit of like maybe having something being done for you, right? So I yeah. think there's that in society, like with social media and all that, um, right now what's being rewarded is anything that could provide a dopamine hit for you. So like because that's, that's how they make profit right now. But if we start to focus on things that would actually provide us with really deep and engaging meaning, then we'll design technologies that would help us do that instead. So um, I think a really great example is I saw this robot that's being made called uh, Moxie, and I like the robot. So the robot's created for kids who are like five to 10 years old. And what's interesting is that it's created in conjunction with child behavioral psychologists, creative storytellers, neuroscientists. And so the, and you know, and uh, kids who use this robot actually could improve in terms of their social ability with people because the robot c encourages that. So yeah. that's how I like to see technology to be designed, not just for people that age. I think we a lot about kids. So that's what we have that, insight that we should make technology that's beneficial for kids but i think it should extend for the rest of the lifetime what if we have technology like really engaging uh technology that helps enrich our lives and helps us engage with not just interacting with the robots themselves right um yeah. so, but the problem is like right after moxie then what did, what what do the kids have well they have chat gpt and to write their essays for them that's like the opposite like chat gpt was created with not considering like different interests of mine, like I think we should have an interdisciplinary team of people who are interested in, in um, creating something that would be enriching for humanity and healthy for its psychology as well. But like, you know, that's what Moxie does, but you know, ChatGPT is not about that. It's about doing things on behalf of you. And the concern of that is that then we won't learn to grow. So ever, you know, from school onwards, um, we won't piece it's really through writing we kind of be able are able to develop our own voice and cultivate it and develop our own thinking faculties right so I would really wish like ChatGPT could be designed a bit more like moxie instead where it encourages us to um, to think to engage in in meaningful ways yeah yeah there's actually lots of positive implications that i've seen and i'm uh, there's lots of things that i like about uh, the possibilities of these tools like uh, i know shamanic one youtuber he developed his own language teaching aid for people uh, using chat gdp style technology yes. or open ai and basically it's a uh, kind of a language trainer that you know will talk to you and will help you and you can talk back to them and they will analyze mm -hmm. your voice and what you say and right. they will you know help you figure things out and you can shoot any level that you're at you know and it will adapt to how you speak and um in that sense like the possibilities of this for helping kids learn in school you know amazing right uh however of course what you mentioned like just printing out an essay and sending it to your teacher and getting an a you know like uh i think as a teacher you know i don't think we can ban this from happening because the truth is anyone can boot up a chat gdp in their own home at the moment you know if they want to and make it and code it and fix it if they want to uh, but what I would say we need to do is we need to properly change our education system and our paradigms by which we 
evaluate essays <laughs> and for example add more criteria for personal contribution and uh you know personal experimentation and examples from your real life you know things that can't be copied or faked or you know taken from somebody else online right yeah i, I absolutely think that's the case and um i do see the value of uh, regulation i mean even you know with the industrial revolution there's a lot of good but also terrible things that came along with it like people were treated pretty horribly and right now i believe that's uh you know that's being done to artists for example so like but later on there are child labor laws there's labor laws in general and that and uh yes people could get around this laws but overall it becomes the mainstream right the, the labor laws become the mainstream and and so that protects most people right and i hope the same thing could be done for artists as well yeah, the reason why I tend to speak against regulation in these uh, topics is because I want solutions to come about organically and I want uh, system change, not necessarily technology related change, because I already think it's pretty shit to be an artist today. It's not that easy when you're starting out and you're trying to figure out your way and like get started and, you know, uh, to uh, find your own tone of voice and who you are in all of these things. And it's not something school or our current education system or society really prepares you for or helps you to do. And there's lots of, uh, you know, uh, bigger systematic issues that I think uh, need to happen. And I think if we just, uh, you know, slap uh, chat GDP with uh, some rules and say, you know, no, no, you can't use it anymore for this and this, this purpose, you know, a lot of people will think the problem is solved. But actually what I am afraid of when it comes to regulation is that this regulation that's going to be put forward is going to be for the big companies, for the big industries. Like what I see when I look at some of the proposals that are being put forward right now is they are written by Disney, they're written by Google, and, you know, with very clear intentions and with very clear, you know, uh, protectionistic desires from these industries to protect their own legacy and their own space, because they are, of course, also very threatened by this kind of technology. Hmm. Yeah, I, I believe there should be um, regulations in place that would be helpful for the common person and also for for common artists. And uh, I've been, uh, I've been through, I went, I went to a talk and it's by the copyright office, and there's I mean, there's artists who are suing, uh, you know, the, these companies like Midjourney, and and they're they're not like necessarily part of something that's a big company, right? They're they're still they still have their own individual practice as well. So I I think it's important, like you know, things are bad, you know, bad for office for artists, but things don't need to be worse. And I believe that. Um, we could have uh, regulations or or things in place that come from an understanding of how science works and how human psychology works, like be able to like for example like um, like I mentioned about Moxie, like use that as an example. So anyway, I think you do make a good point. Like things cannot just be primarily driven by regulation, right? What we need to do is be able to change the collective consciousness of how people think about this technology. So really encourage people to be able to want to have technology that is beneficial rather than that, which, which uh, could be detrimental. Yeah. I can say how I personally came to experience these tools and how I was influenced by them because uh, I tried out my journey and I started creating art and I started, you know, using it for writing and testing it out to see what it was capable of very early because I love new technology and I love new ideas. And I'm actually very eager to see what is possible with these things. However, what I came to notice was it made me appreciate art more than what I expected. Like it yeah. got my eyes to open, you know, and, you know, at some point, you know, in the beginning, I was like, wow, that's so interesting that Mid Journey can do this. But what I eventually realized was that Mid Journey had gravitated towards its own style. And at some point I was bored of it. Now, if I look online, I can recognize Mid Journey in two seconds. It has yes. its own distinct like vibe and it does, uh, yeah. uh from that point of view like uh I, I see the potential of this kind of technology to inspire people to write i see the potential of it to inspire people to create art and to create music and to create in all kinds of forms however it's very important that people don't become demoralized and that people don't compare themselves to these technologies right because if we start feeling like oh but i can't write like them you know, you don't need to. The truth is, you don't have to speak the way they do. You know, whenever you ask ChatGPT a question, it's going to give you a listicle. 
because listicles are the most common form of content online. And that's what it's always going to be <laughs> because that's how chat GDP thinks. And if you ask right. me journey to paint a painting, you know, it's always going to be the same style, but you don't have to have that style and you don't have to compare yourself to that or do what th these technologies do. Uh, you can find your own voice and your own way of writing, which works for you. That, that that's, that's very insightful. So same thing with how you like approach mid journey, like it, it was like at first impressive, but then you saw like actually it has a lot of limitations. The same thing because I love to write, right? So I looked into chat GBT and at first I was like, wow, this is really impressive. But then not too long into it, then I started to see, oh, it kind of has like these very common patterns that are very plain. And I, I, the one thing I do is I, I like to do magic tricks. And I realized that ChatGPT actually operates the same way. It does some things that make it look impressive, but it's really just smokes and mirrors. Because for, first of all, like I try to, for example, I want to test ChatGPT to see if it could write about a topic which, you know, which is going to be really weird and very rare. So I asked it to uh, have a cat and a dog compare their teeth, right? Because it's, it's like an unusual topic, but then it was able to do so. It's like, wow, that's really impressive. And it was able to recognize it. It actually had a line that says, well, this is something that's really unusual, but a cat and dog are comparing his teeth. I was like, wow, I was able to pick up on how unusual it is. But then I read other essays written by ChatGPT online or stories and actually uses the same phrases like, wow, this is a very unusual topic. So it's able to identify whenever there's an unusual topic and always use that same phrase. And yeah. And, and whenever there's a comparison between two different things, it always uses the same kind of format. Like, uh, so uh, so it's actually kind of cheesy in a way. So there's a lot of hype mm -hmm. around ChatGPT. It's actually much less impressive. Uh, I could see it doing certain kind of things like maybe some level of academic writing because you know a lot of academic writing, it almost looks like it's written by the same person over and over, right? So I could yeah. see like certain, or like if it's like reporting about facts about like, a sport, a sport, maybe, but then, you know, I'm concerned about the hype because, you know, if people really believe in a hype, uh, they're not, they may not really engage their creative faculties. They may just rely on this chat GBT in order to do things for them, which is actually not capable of doing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people seem extremely proud over the responses that are generated. When I look at it, I'm like, really? Is that the best it can do? Like uh, a lot of these topics sound extremely dry and boring. And, you know, like uh, uh, there's a certain part of it that you brought up just now that I find very interesting. And that's uh, it will say, you know, that's a very unusual topic. You know, it, it's very good at faking empathy, like faking, right. you know, things that make you feel good and make it sound like it's super nice towards you. Um, but and in a sense, you know, that makes people like it more, right? Because if it's nice to me, you know, then I'm of course gonna like it more. And then, you know, like it it knows exactly how what buttons to press and by looking at, you know, what kind of things normally work for people. Now right. uh we could probably talk about this the entire day, but uh, one thing I wanted to kind of wrap up with is just a question, and that's how do you envision human machine interactions in the future? Like, how do you see our relationship to this, like in 10 or 20 years? Like, what are we going to be doing and how it's, how is this all going to evolve in the, if you could say the best case scenario? Okay. Well, the first thing that came to mind is something more of a worst case scenario. So that's like Fair almost enough. like the movie, the movie Her, where uh, this guy decides to make a, uh, basically an AI girlfriend. And the thing is the AI girlfriend was programmed to have a personality which he would like. And that's why, of course, they, they would get along. So my mm -hmm. issue with that is that, you know, you, they could design technologies that could say very pleasing things to people, but we're not going to benefit from it because we learn through conflict. We learn from having uh, in, uh, conflict in, in relationships with, with one another and mm -hmm. having to work that out. And that's what actually deepens the relationship over time or deepens like our sense of meaning and human connection. So what I hope is like kind of that we could be able to design uh, systems that uh, just like that with that Moxie robot could encourage us to engage with people more, like maybe get us to work in teams more and that the robot and AI could be supportive of that and, and, and encourage us in that direction. 
Oh, I really like that train of thought uh, because that's what I'm all about these days, getting people to stop uh, obsessing over the superficial and artificial and getting people to go out and live their own lives and find their own voice. And the truth is, I uh, recently watched uh, her again. And uh, there was one particular scene, you know, when uh, he's uh, arguing with his ex-girlfriend to sign the divorce papers. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, she just says everything uh, that I think th that was really like how she said it. What she said was basically, uh, you're afraid of anything that's real. Like, uh, in a sense, I think a lot of this development risks coming about as a result of anxiety because you're anxious to, you know, talk to people or go out you, uh, my, or to do your own truth or to draw your own art or to create your own writing. You know, it's so easy to gravitate towards wanting to use these kind of technologies to do it for you. And it could be that's extremely true. demoralizing and soul crushing in the longer perspective. It's true. I think you have a really good point. That's why I like technology like meetup.com, where it's an example where it's bringing people together to do things. And yeah. you, you tap into like, we we all have that negative tendency potential within, within us where we want to be perfect and we're afraid to um, take action. Right. And, um, and all this technology is the reflection of that, is a reflection of our kind of like the negative aspects of our psychology, but it could also be a reflection of the positive aspects too. And we, we have been creating technologies that show that in the, in the past, and hopefully that'll be more of a thing in the future too, something that would help us to be able to be engaged with the process, not just the results, like not just like an image at the end, right? Or something that would help us to be able to connect with people in a more meaningful way, encourage like really rich interactions. For sure, for sure. I want to say uh, thank you so much for joining me in this discussion. The truth was I really needed this discussion because this has been spinning in my head for a long time. It has been I, for me too. <laughs> yeah, it felt like a very important topic to talk about. And uh, I thought you were the perfect person to do it with too. Um, I can say to all the viewers, uh, Leon has uh, made some really amazing videos on the INFP personality type on his channel type tips, but he's also talked about uh, personality psychology and Carl Jung's theories and the cognitive functions in a really original way. Like you, you really hit the originality in a sense of being able to bring out, you know, the unique nuances of the theory that, you know, any general YouTube video you can find if you Google INFJs or INFPs online will miss. So if you're looking you. for the hidden truths of uh, these personality types and, you know, the deeper nuances, uh, I definitely can recommend Leon's channel. Thank you. And I also have another channel as well as my psychotherapy channel in which I teach about mental health. So if you if you want to take a look at that, uh, definitely do. I'll link to both channels down below.